Welcome back to another weekly Space News Rundown. We have seen a lot of demolition works at Starbase over the past week, and not all of it intentional, as SpaceX works hard towards Starship Flight 3. We saw the first ever direct-to-sell text message conversation over SpaceX's new Starlink satellites, the maiden flight of the ocean-launched Gravity 1, big progress from Blue Origin, the rollout of NASA's ambitious X-59 supersonic aircraft, and much, much, much more. Let's jump right into things. At the Starbase Orbital Launch Site, work continues with the scrapping of the vertical tanks. Workers were seen on Monday continuing to cut up the removed GSE-8 water tank shell with torches at the roadside, with the tank itself hooked up to a lifting rig awaiting its removal, which happened the next day, last Tuesday. Workers then wasted no time beginning the scrapping process. After completing a single cryo test at the Macy's site, Ship 30 was rolled back to the production facility, where it was then placed alongside Ship 26 in the rocket garden. Now, on the subject of Ship 26, the mysterious works to this vehicle continue. Everyone's favourite flapless prototype was expected to be scrapped after being hooked up to a crane, but over the past few weeks, we've been seeing workers installing structural reinforcement stringers to its exterior. None of the other Starship prototypes have these, so SpaceX's reasoning for installing them is certainly intriguing. Is this a pathfinder for the V2 Starships, or does Ship 26 have less internal reinforcement than the other ships, thus requiring these? Or is it something else entirely? Frankly, I would still be surprised to see Ship 26 fly at all, so it's definitely something we're all keeping a close eye on. What do you think the purpose of this is? Let me know in the comments down below. The most recent thing we've seen with this prototype was its removal from the crane on Tuesday, which was then followed up with its roll back to the crane on Wednesday. Following all of this, Ship 30 left the rocket garden once again, this time heading for the high bay. A brief shuffle of ships was needed, so Ship 31 was moved outside, and Ship 32 relocated to the rocket garden before both Ship 30 and Ship 31 were moved back in. The new Starship Mega Bay looks like it's been damaged. Boca Chica Gal captured this video of some of its exterior siding peeling away. Current speculation is that a crane may have punched through it by accident. Oops! An intended bit of destruction came on Saturday with the demolition of Tent 3. All the tents at Starbase will, of course, be replaced by the Star Factory, which itself saw a good amount of expansion over the course of the week, with crews working around the clock on building up the latest section. Back at Macy's, Booster 12 performed its second cryo test, first the complete filling of the lower tank, then the complete filling of the upper tank, which we can tell from the frost line forming all the way up the entirety of the booster. So overall, lots of fun happening at Starbase, but most of SpaceX's efforts right now are working on ground support equipment while we wait for Ship 28 and Booster 10 to undergo final checkouts before launch, and of course, we still await confirmation from the FAA that they've completed their investigation into the mishap of Flight 2 and their issuance of a launch license for Flight 3. We have big Starlink updates to talk about. In last Monday's episode, I talked about the 3rd of January's Starlink launch from Vandenberg, where a Falcon 9 carried 21 Starlink V2 satellites to low Earth orbit, with six of the satellites, the ones at the top of the stack, which look slightly different to the rest. These were the first six V2 satellites with direct-to-cell capability. These Starlink satellites enable mobile phones to establish a direct connection without the need for a ground dish. According to SpaceX, these will function as a cell tower in space, providing access to texting, calling, and browsing in what would normally be signal dead zones. While the current service is limited to just texting, SpaceX plans to expand the capabilities as they deploy more of these satellites. And last week, the SpaceX team sent and received the first ever text message through the direct to sell satellites just six days after launch. I love the conversation of choice. Very SpaceX to opt for new phone who dis rather than something all grand and congratulatory. <laughs> SpaceX also pulled off another two Starlink launches last week, growing the constellation by another 45 satellites. The first launch was yesterday, the 14th of January, with the Falcon 9 launching from Vandenberg in California, carrying 22 Starlink V2 satellites to orbit, with the first stage making a successful landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You following stage separation. In the early hours of today, so Monday the 15th of January, another Falcon 9 lifted off, this time from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, carrying 23 Starlink V2s to orbit. And after stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship. 
Blue Origin looks like it's rapidly closing in on finally testing flight hardware for an orbital class rocket. The first ever flight ready New Glenn first stage was rolled out of the Blue Origin production facility last week and transported down to the Blue Origin launch pad and hangar as captured here by NASA Spaceflight Space Coast Livestream and Max Evans. As of right now, we're not sure how close this booster is for being ready for flight. The interstage is marked as not for flight, so this is only a placeholder used for either testing or transport only, and the aft section is sealed over at its base, so we can't tell if there are any BE-4 engines installed yet. Now I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next for this prototype. Will we see it go vertical on the launch pad to begin testing? And what testing will we see? Hopefully we'll see some engines being fired, though of course, as mentioned, we don't know for sure yet if there are any of the seven BE-4 engines installed on this booster yet. Blue Origin CEO David Limp did share some photos of the booster in the hangar at Launch Complex 36, in addition to some pictures of the second stage, which as you can see, definitely does have its engines, two BE-3Us. The BE-4 engines did get their first flight last Monday though, with the maiden flight of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur. Now, I covered this launch a few hours after it happened in last Monday's episode, but in the days that followed, ULA shared some additional footage of the rocket launch, giving us some great new shots to marvel at, and also some B-roll, while I talk about the less happy news. While the launch was a success, the Peregrine moon lander sadly was not. It suffered from an excessive propellant leak, and as such, Astrobotic had to make the difficult decision to end the spacecraft's mission by allowing it to burn up during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, without making any changes to its current trajectory. As such, the vehicle will be destroyed very soon, with Astrobotics forecasting the mission to come to conclusion on the 18th of January. We had a very fun to watch launch from the seas of China last week. This was the maiden flight of the Gravity One launch vehicle, which lifted off from its ocean platform in the Yellow Sea last Thursday. The flight profile of this rocket is an interesting one. There are four solid rocket motors which surround a single solid rocket motor core, so five in total, but at liftoff only the peripheral boosters ignite, the core stage doesn't. It only ignites right before the four peripheral boosters run out of fuel. All the stages of this rocket are solid fuel actually, and with a payload capacity of 6.5 tons to low Earth orbit, its maiden launch broke the record for both the world's largest solid fuel carrier rocket and China's most powerful commercial launch vehicle to date. Now, Gravity One wasn't the only Chinese launch we saw last week. On Tuesday, the 19th of January, the Long March 2C launched the Einstein probe to low Earth orbit. Einstein is an X-ray space telescope and was developed jointly by the Chinese Academy of Sciences in partnership with the European Space Agency, which is kind of interesting. Most of the time, Chinese projects are developed solely by China themselves. The telescope will be used to monitor X-ray flares from inactive black holes, in addition to detecting electromagnetic signals from events that trigger gravitational waves, such as the merging of neutron stars, as well as conducting surveillance of the entire night sky for transient phenomena and study known variable X-ray sources. The third and final launch from China was a Kwaizu 1A, which launched on Thursday carrying the Tianjin 102 satellite to low Earth orbit. The satellite was developed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and will reportedly be used for space environment observations. We saw a launch out of Japan last week as well. A beefy H2A-202 rocket blasted off from Tanegashima's Yoshinobu launch complex last Friday, carrying the IGS Optical 8 spy satellites to orbit. The satellite is operated by the Cabinet Intelligence and Research Office, the Japanese equivalent of the American Central Intelligence Agency, you know, the CIA, and so as you can imagine, the payload is therefore fairly classified, so there's not really a whole lot else I can discuss with this one. After several years of development, we finally saw the rollout of NASA's X-59 aircraft. Developed at the legendary Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, the X-59 is a one-of-a-kind machine which will support NASA's Quest mission to demonstrate the ability to fly supersonic while generating as little noise as possible. Instead of an ear-splitting, window-shattering sonic boom, the X-59 will produce a gentle sonic thump enabled by its very unique shape. It's a very sleek design, as you can see, with an incredibly long nose. The eagle-eyed among you may notice there isn't actually any way for the pilot to see what's in front of them because of that flush cockpit. So the X-59 will use what NASA calls an enhanced flight vision system, which consists of a forward 4K camera with a 33 by 19 degree angle of view. Flight testing is expected to begin later this year, and I for one am very excited to see it. 
Lown Aerospace had another busy week. I decided that now would be a great time to start a KSP2 for beginners playthrough of Kerbal Space Program 2's new exploration mode. I walk you through the steps required to unlock the whole first tier of the new tech tree, starting with simple suborbital hop flights, before going through the art of the gravity turn to reach orbit, and finally moving on to home and transfer orbits to reach other celestial objects, in this case, the Mun. Statistically, this video should be one of the cards on screen, so if it sounds like fun, then do check it out. But otherwise, big thank you for watching today's episode of Space This Week, and massive thanks to the names on screen who support what I do here financially and make all of this content possible. Thanks again for watching once again, and I'll catch you in the next one. Aiming for another KSP2 video for Saturday, we'll be having a crack at a stock USS Enterprise, so look forward to that.